Section number forty one of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Appendix Charles Perrault by James Planchet. Member of the Académie Française and Premier Commissaire de Batement du Roy, was born, as he himself tells us, in the memories that he left to his children, in Paris on the 12th of January, 1628, and at eight and a half years of age was sent to the College of Beauvais, where he gave early proof of his literary abilities. He died in 1703. Although the author of many credible compositions, both in prose and verse, he is indebted for his celebrity to that collection of fairy tales which, under the titles of Histories au Conte du Terme Passé, were first published in 1697, and speedily obtained a worldwide popularity as Le Conte de la Ma Mère de l'Oi, known in England as Mother Goose's Fairy Tales. They were published by Perrault under the name of his son, Perrault de Amacor, at that time a child only ten years old, whose name is appended to the dedication of the first edition to Mademoiselle, i.e. Elizabeth Charlotte de Orleans, sister of Philippe, Duke of Chartres, and after the death of Louis the Fourteenth, Regent of France. Mademoiselle was born 13th September, 1676. The title, Comte de la Ma Mère l'Oi, has given rise to much controversy and a great deal of paper, not to say learning, has been wasted in the attempt to discover the original source of the stories and the reason of their being called those of ma mere l'oeil the former question i shall reserve for discussion in my notices of the tales themselves the latter we will dispose of at once monsieur colin de placy in his valuable edition of le ouvre chaussée de charles perrault eight volumes paris eighteen twenty six and Baron Wachener, in his letters sur le Comte de Fille à tribute à la Perrault, etc., Paris, 12 mot, same date, have pretty well exhausted the subject. The three principal deviations that have been insisted upon are, firstly, that in an ancient fabulo a goose is represented telling stories to her goslings, worthy of them and of her secondly that in the front piece to the first edition of perrault's fairy tales an old woman is represented spinning and beside her are three children one boy and two girls whom she is apparently amusing by her stories and that as underneath this are the words caught de ma mère l'oeil footnote ce qui nous indique que ce recueil contient le conte vulgairement connu ce titre b w end footnote this old woman is no less a personage than ma mère l'oeil in propria personoa thirdly that ma mère d'oeil is one and the same individual with la reine pédéuque the goose or bird-footed queen a sobriquet applied by some to a bertha queen of france and by others to saint claude and the queen of saba the first is an assertion without proof the second a mere opinion which is instantly met by another namely that the old woman is repeating to her hearers the story of ma mere l'oeil the third is a tangible proposition and has been dealt with accordingly 
at st marie de nestle in the diocese of troyes at st benin de dijon and at st pierre de la neve st porcon de auvergne and in divers other churches in france the statue is to be seen of a queen with a webbed foot and therefore called la reine pied de oie or pedic footnote oi being derived from the low latin word oca du cange in vos end footnote this statue is said by malbion but without giving any authority for his assertion to represent saint clothitude the abbey le Bouf believes that the origin of this name is to be found at toulouse he quotes a passage in rabelais who speaking of certain large-footed persons says they were splay-footed like geese or queen padique in her portrait formerly at toulouse and the abbey concludes says monsieur de plancy curious enough that the queen padique is the queen of saba supporting his opinion by the following tale in the targum of jerusalem the queen of saba was so fond of bathing that she plunged every day in the sea when she went to visit solomon he received her in an apartment of crystal the queen of saba on entering it imagined that the monarch was in the water and in order to pass through it to him she lifted her robe the king then seeing her feet which were hideous said to her your face unites all the charms of the most beautiful women but your legs and feet correspond but little to it even if we could suppose solomon to have been so ingallant there does not appear much in this hebrew story to bear upon the subject for what possible reason was there for attributing these stories to the queen of salba bullet doyen of the university of bescon goes back to the eleventh century in france for the source of this epithet the good king robert had married his relative bertha george v compelled him to divorce her and imposed on him penance of seven years the king who loved bertha refused obedience and the pope excommunicated him he was deserted by everybody except two servants in the meanwhile bertha was said to have been brought to bed of a monster resembling an ill-formed duck or according to others a goose abon abbot of fleury brought the supposed offspring to the king who horrified at the sight of it repudicated bertha leaving her however the title of queen the dreadful story was circulated that she had given birth to a goose and that she had herself become goose-footed as a punishment for her criminal marriage her name of bertha gave more authority to this story in the eyes of the people they remembered that bertha or bertrade wife of pepin le Boeuf, was surnamed bertha with the great foot because she had one foot larger than the other and they called the repudicated wife of robert bertha opied de oie it is possible also remarks monsieur de plancy that this fable was invented to flatter queen constance who succeeded her for it was the period of credulity and superstition constance went to toulouse she was lodged in front of an aqueduct so narrow that a man could not pass through it to amaze the princess they told her it was the bridge to, of queen goose or of the queen with the goose's foot this story was afterwards amplified and it became a saying that queen paduke was of toulouse in the contes d'entrapole by noel de fail published during the latter half of the sixteenth century a man is made to swear by the spindle of queen paduke and therefore bullet assumes that she must have been queen bertha because there is an old french saying 
when queen bertha spun footnote the italians have the same proverb nel tempo of bertha filava and footnote which is applied to any marvellous story of bygone days or to events that are said to have happened once upon a time this is very inconclusive in the middle ages spinning was a favorite occupation of queens and princesses and queen bertha was by no means an exception footnote in the coffin of jean de bourgogne the first wife of philip de valois were found the queen's ring of silver her distaff and spindle the tomb of jean de bourbon queen of charles v of france also contained part of her crown her golden ring and her distaff of gilt wood vive lenore notes historique sur les exhumations fait en seventeen ninety three dans l'abbé de saint denis End footnote there is another french saying similarly applied to an incredible tale it is of the time when king robert sang to the lute the said king robert being the husband of queen bertha this is all tantamount only to our old english sayings when adam was a little boy and when adam delved and eve span etc it is also more than probable that the bertha of the proverb is identical with the frau berchetta of german superstition she is said to live in the imaginations of the upper german races in austria bavaria swabia alsace switzerland and some districts of thurginia and Franconia. she appears in the twelve nights as a woman with shaggy hair to inspect the spinners when fish and porridge are to be eaten in honor of her and all the distaffs must be spun off this superstition was also common in england partly work and partly play you must on saint distaff's day that is the day after twelfth day and is evidently the relic of some pagan rite in honor most probably of freya or frega the venus of the scandinavians dame bertha horned is one of the characters in Le evangiles de conoils quinoils the joint composition of jean de arras and three other writers in fourteen seventy five it was translated into english and printed by winklin de ward with the title of the gospels of de staffs footnote see a learned and interesting paper on the distaff and spindle by j y ackerman esq sec f s a archipologia volume thirty seven and footnote a writer who signs himself philetissimus has actually pointed out a more probable origin of the title of comte de la ma or de la mere de l'oeil which it is clear from passages in boileau and molaire were applied to a certain collection of old stories long before perrault published his histoire du temps passé this writer refers us to customs of antiquity and the superstitions of the middle ages he recalls to us that the ancient romans confided their dwellings to the care of their geese he alludes to the two hundred thousand crusaders who in ten ninety six directed their march by the flight of a goose from hungary to jerusalem to the guardian fairies of the chateau de piron in the continent who at that time of the invasion of the normans transformed themselves into wild geese to the benevolent and protecting dwarfs of the canton of Bern, who are said to have been all goose-footed and above all to marguerite de la navarre who in her heptamoron calls herself oisily and he concludes by saying c'est 
que la bonne dame aussi veuve de grande expérience y represente la mère de l'oeil c'est que un conte de moins discreet elle sait terri toujours une conclusion favorable à la morale conte de la mère l'oeil c'est à dire conte de la vie grande mère j'accuse un crien comme l'oeil mais comme l'oeil surtout gardien villageant de la maison je l'ai dear de la vertu there is amongst all this suggestion one fact to repose upon it is that perrault was not the inventor of the stories he published that he merely transmitted to writing no doubt with some touches of his own tales of the nursery which had descended orally from the earliest ages of the celtic occupation of america or Bretagne, to the particular superstitions of which we f shall find, as we proceed, they have more or less reference, and that the particular stories printed in the first edition of his Historie du Temps Passé had long been popularly known as Comte de la Mer l'Oeil. In 1678, at the age of fifty, Perrault retired from his public office to dedicate himself entirely to the literature and the education of his children. Some ten years afterwards he composed a novel in verse, founded on a celebrated tale in the Decamoron of Boccaccio, and well known to us as Patient Grisel, his title being La Marquise de Salusis, ou la patience de grisolides it was published at paris by jean patiste colinarg in 1691 la fontaine had as early as 1678 said in the fourth fable of his eighth book le pouvoir de la fable et moi même au moment qui fait cette moralité si peu de n mais été conté, j'y prétendais un plaisir extreme. These lines, it would seem, induce Perrault to versify the old nursery story of Poe de N, with which Louis the Fourteenth, when an infant, used to be rocked to sleep, and in 1694, on the publication of the second edition of the second edition of his Gridlidus he added to his material version of potan and le sohait ridicules known to us as the three wishes the success of these stories led him to publish in sixteen ninety seven his collection of le conte de la mer de oi under the title of histories du temps passé and in the name of his son as before stated this collection consisted of eight stories only, all in prose, La Belle au Boy Dormant, Le Petit Chaperon Rouge, Barbe Bleu, Le Chat Bot, Les Fris, Cendron, Riquet à la Hoop, and Le Petit Poussette, a proof that Poe de Anne was not one of the Comte de la Ma Mère l'Oeil or any more than grizzlids or le sohe ridicule the same eight stories alone appear in the second edition in seventeen o seven four years after the death of perrault and in the third edition by nicholas goslin in seventeen twenty four it is not until seventeen forty two when an edition of the histoire du temps passé was published at the hague footnote there was another edition in french and english published at the hague three years afterwards comte de la mer l'oeil en francais et en anglais par perrault avec des figures graves pour folk la haye nomi 1745 twelve months it was a rare book in 1784 when it was sold at the sale of the library of the duke 
de la Valerie for twenty three livres nineteen sous. End footnote. That we find any addition to the first eight stories, and then we leave, and then we have for the first time the story of Landroit Princess. Oh, Les Aventures de Finette presented to us with a dedication to the Countess of Marat as a story by Perrault, although a story with that title and on that subject was published by Mademoiselle Le Hertier in 1696 in a work entitled L'Ouvre Melee, Contente Nouvelle et Autre Ouvrage en Verse et en Prose in which also appears a letter from the author to the daughter of Perrault, but even in the Hague edition of 1742 there is no Poe de Anne, and it is only in comparatively modern collections that a prose version of that story, as well as the one in verse actually written by Perrault, is, with La Android Princess, Grislid, and le sohe ridicule added to the eight original contes de la mere Oli, or historie de la temps passé from these eight stories i have selected six omitting only le petit chaperon rouge and les filles so well known in the nursery as little red riding hood why riding and toads and diamonds and for the atmosphere of which they are alone calculated. On the others I shall now offer a few observations in their order of publication, and in the same spirit as those apprehended to the fairy tales of the Countess de Aulnoy. Bluebeard La Barbe Blue is founded, according to Monsieur Colin de Plancy, on a tradition of lower Brittany, and he remarks that Perrault must have heard it from the lips of nurses, or perhaps peasants, to have written with so much naivety the scene of Sister Anne. He states also that it is pretended that Bluebeard was actually nobleman of the house of Beaumanoir. He does not, however, seem to have been aware that the original of this terrible portrait is also said to have been Gil de Laval, Seigneur de Reyes, created Marshal de France, June twenty first, fourteen twenty nine, for his defence of Orleans against the English, but whose infamous conduct in Brittany so exasperated the public against him that in 1440 he was arrested by order of the procureur-general de Bretagne, and, having been tried and found guilty, was condemned to be hanged and burnt, and underwent that sentence in a field at Nantes, on the 8th of October, some say 23rd of December, of that same year, after exhibiting, says the chronicler, great signs of repentance. His body was taken out of the flames, and buried in the church of the Carmelites at Nantes. It was, we are told, his taste for luxury and libertinism which plunged him into all the crimes for which he was so fearfully punished. He squandered a revenue of two hundred thousand crowns per annum, an enormous sum in those days, and which he had inherited at the age of twenty he never travelled without being accompanied by an army of cooks musicians dancers of both sexes packs of hounds and two hundred saddle horses unfortunately for him he thought it necessary to include in his suite of attendants some fortune tellers and pretended magicians which it is possible in those days may have caused the credulous multitude to impute him some atrocities of which he may have been innocent the whole process is said to be still extent but we are not furnished with any details which would identify him with the gentleman who rejoiced in a blue beard and expatiated his offences by being run through the body with cold iron instead of being roasted at a stake like the guilty but 
pennant marshal footnote mr dunlop who alludes to this story speaks of the murder of his wives the author of la art de verfer de dates gives him but one wife catherine de thors daughter and heiress of mille de thorens seigneur de chabonnet a confluent whom he married december thirty first fourteen twenty and who survived him and was remarried to jean de veldome vidimine de amines she therefore lived with him for twenty years and bore him one daughter marie de laval dame de rays who married twice and died the first of november fourteen fifty eight Pere Alcimi says he was contracted in 1416 to Jean Payel, daughter and co heiress of Forks, Seigneur de Hamby, but that she died previous to the celebration of the marriage. End note. Whether the line of Beaumar or Laval has the best claim to the honor of his relationship may still be a matter of dispute but the fact more important to our present inquiry is that in either case it is a tradition of bretagne and therefore strengthens the theory of monsieur de plancy and the baron walkenier there is no fairy in this story but there is an enchanted key la clef says the author etate fee in the old translations this is rendered the key was a fairy fee is however in such instances as these not a noun of substantive but an adjective now obsolete but to be found in cotgrave spelt with a third e in the feminine fee masculine e e feminine fatal appointed destined also taken bewitched or forespoken also charmed enchanted edit sixteen fifty there is another popular passage in this story which requires a word of remark je vois rien que le soleil qui produire le herbe qui verdoy this has been generally translated i see nothing but the sun which makes a dust and the grass which looks green Monsieur de la Plancy appends a note to this passage as follows: One, Poudrier darder et bleur les yeux. Two, Verdoyer jeter un éclat vert. With great submission to so high an authority, I must venture to differ with him on this point. Poudrier is an old French verb signifying to reduce to powder. Je pourdori, tu pourdoris, il pourdori, etc. Un cheval espagnol pourdoriant to le champ. J. B. Rose and Bachelier, in his Dictionnaire National, remarks, quoting the actual passage from Perrault, Simon sonore poétique, espagnol un paraphrase et a regatier verdoyer is also a verb active signifying to grow or become green and i have therefore taken the liberty to render the above celebrated reply i see nothing but the sun making dust that is to say reducing the soil to dust by its heat and the grass growing green it is the flock of sheep that afterwards raise or make a dust it must be though i am making a dust to use a familiar phrase about a trifle but i wish to point out that unless we could say in english the sun that dusts and the grass that greens we cannot approach the tense and graphic description of dear sister anne monsieur de plancy observes that the incidents of the story excepting of course that of the enchanted key are not impossible provided they are supposed to have occurred in the middle ages but that perrault has placed them nearer his own times 
by saying that bluebird widow employed part of her fortune in purchasing commissions for her two brothers as the sale of commissions in the french army was not known before the reign of francis i but he does not notice that the mention of dragons and musketeers brings them still nearer bluebird has been a favorite subject with the dramatists both french and english the celebrated melodrama by george coleman the younger produced at drury lane theatre in seventeen ninety eight in which the scene was transferred to the east was rendered still more popular by the music of michael kelly the march in bluebird was perpetrated on every piano alternately with the duke of york's march the battle of prague and the overture to laudisca the sleeping beauty in the wood the charming fairy tale of la belle au boy dormant is the gem of the collection its popularity is as great as the present day as it was two hundred years ago i have called the reader's attention in a marginal note to the first mention probably of seven league boots footnote in the marginal note i have mentioned jack and the beanstalk this is an error there are no seven league boots in that story it is jack the giant killer only who is the fortunate proprietor of the shoes of swiftness which either suggested or were suggested by the boots aforesaid End of footnote. but i reserve for the appendix some observations upon the earliest mention of ogres and ogresses the baron walkner in his letters already quoted has i think successfully combated the earlier notion that the word ogre was derived from a classical source he deduces it from the ogres or igors a turkish race mentioned by prosipius in the sixth century some tribes of the igors established themselves in the crimea and their language was called linguia ogoresa by the italian merchants who first traded with them in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries all tatars were confounded under the name of ogures when the madgars a tartar tribe from the banks of the volga overran dacia and panoria the names of the ancient huns and of the ferocious ogures were united to designate them they were first called huni gores and their country hunic gori from whence hungaris and hungary the atrocities committed by and attributed to the ogores spread horror and alarm throughout europe their cruelties to infants in which they have been only equalled by the barbarous sepoys in the recent calamitous events in india took especial hold of the imaginations of those to whose care children were specially entrusted and the appellation of augur or ogre became synonymous with that of cannibal or any other ferocious monster in human form in roquefort's glossaire de la langue romaine ogre is also derived from the same source that hirco of the italians the orico of bojardo and aristo may be derived from the latin orcus according to minmusi as mr knightley imagines i am not prepared to dispute such curious coincidences are common to all who have wandered in the mazes of etymology but i will merely suggest that it is quite as probable that orco and hiroko were also derived from augur the name by which the tartars of the crimea were known to the italians as early as the twelfth century as we have already seen florio however fifteen ninety eight says 
orco as orca a sea monster which the ogre never was spinning with the distaff is the oldest form a wheel appears in illuminations of the fourteenth century but the woman hent stood to her work the more modern spinning wheel at which women sit was invented in fifteen thirty by a citizen of brunswick named jurgen for illustration of the accident to the princess it is perhaps worthy of remark that in the pyrenees and western provinces of france the spindle is sometimes pointed with iron it is thus says mr akerman the author of a paper on the distaff in the archaeologia volume thirty seven rendered a stiletto with which the woman could defend herself the same antiquary informs us that the art of spinning in its simplest and most primitive forms is yet pursued in italy where the women of caia still twirl the spindle unrestrained by that ancient rustic law which forbade its use without doors so that the father of the sleeping beauty had a sort of precedent for his must not spin with spindles act the germans have a version of this story called briar rose feed grimm's kinder und hausmarken master cat or puss in boots matrix chat ou le chat bot this capital story is said by mr dunlop and mr knightley to be taken from a collection of stories by giovin francisco strapola printed at venice in fifteen fifty to fifteen fifty four under the titles of tradici paciavol not and translated into france with considerable embellishments in fifteen eighty five that the first story of the eleventh night is derived from the same source as perrault's there can be little doubt but i am not by any means prepared to admit that perrault was indebted to that or any other printed collection for this or any one of these eight stories which is clear were well known in france as le conte de la mer l'oeil strapola who seems to have borrowed largely from morlini and collected stories wherever he could find them drew upon the traditions of brittany as well as the fablo of provence it is indeed notorious that the italian novelists were indebted almost entirely to the trover or troubadours of languedoc whilst they themselves admit that the plots of their romances were of american origin in brittany of old time these lays were wrought so saith this rhyme says the old translator of lay lafraine the author of which mr dunlop acknowledges must have been better informed than any modern writer history of fiction eight volumes eighteen forty five page one ninety six in the second edition of the countess de alnoy's fairy tales i took an opportunity of vindicating that lady from the charge so hastily preferred against her both by mr dunlop and mr knightley and now i contest as strongly the accuracy of the opinions of the same writers respecting the tales of charles perrault neither in the story of strapola first of the eleventh night nor in the gagliuso of signor basil whose penta morene published in sixteen seventy two is also roundly asserted to have been the origin of the french conte de fee footnote of the ten stories in the mother goose's fairy tales of perrault seven are found to be in the pentamarone says mr knightley in his tales and fictions page one eighty four i have already shown that there were only eight stories in the conte de la mer l'oeil and in the pentamarone i find but two that have any similitude to the tales of perrault viz gangliuso and 
legata centralota both differing widely in many points from the ancient breton traditions End footnote. do we find puss in boots what would la matre chat be were he not also le chat bot nor is there an ogre that is special characteristic of a legend of brittany not consequently the delicious scene between him and puss which so dramatically winds up the french story the same unmistakable indications of its being veritable histoire de temps passé militate against the brief alluded to by monsieur de plancy that the marquis de caraba was intended as a portrait of some particular nobleman of the time of louis the fourteenth and therefore that the usurpation of the castle and property of the ogre might be an allusion to the indelicate seizure by de Aubergine of the domains of a protestant an exile in consequence of the religious persecutions at the close of the seventeenth century in which case he adds the cat would be madame de maintenon what a pity so ingenious an idea would be destitute of foundation it is more probable that the wits of the day compared the illustrious individuals to the marquis de cabra and his cat i have kept the old english title of puss in boots though it is not literally that of the original it would have been an indictable offence to have altered it the tricks of the cat to catch the rats are described almost in the words of la fontaine in his fable of le chat et le vieux rat in which maitre Mitty, le alexander de chat a second rodilliard se peine la tête en basse and se alafraine for the same purpose cinderella or the little glass slipper centrillion ou la petite panfolie de verre here again could it enter the heart of an englishman to call this anything but cinderella i am proud to say i was not equal to such a sacrifice to principle i should have been afraid to meet the eyes of my grandchildren there are persons however who have been cruel enough to tamper with the second title to destroy the little glass slipper and to tell us that in the original story it was not pantoufle de verre but du verre i e a fur much worn in the middle ages and from which the charge of verre in heldery was taken i thank the stars that i have not been able to discover any foundation for this alarming report even should it be unfortunately the fact it would not affect the comte de ma mere l'oeil as handed down to us by perrault in that it is an undeniable pantoufle de verre and has been said to represent allegorically the extreme fragility of woman's reputation and the prudence of flight before it is too late there appears to be no doubt that this story is founded on an old american tradition as in eighteen twenty six an alteration of an ancient breton chronicle was published by madame petit entitled laurette de carnabas o la nouvelle cendrillon which is taken from the same source but divested of its fairy agency and the countess de Aulnoy had previously availed herself of some portions of the tale of the cendrillon in her story of finette cendron the trial of the slipper is like that of the ring in the story of po de Anne, and a little glass shoe is the subject of a german fairy tale the germans have also a version of cinderella in which the slipper is of pure gold at the banquet it will be remembered that the prince is said to have given cinderella both oranges and citrons 
these do not appear to us at present as particularly suggested of the magnificent of a royal collation but in the seventeenth century portugal oranges were considered a present worthy princes of the blood monsieur me vint voir says the duchesse de montpensier in her memoirs il me donne de oranges de portugal Moller, in his description of the comedy which formed a portion of the famous fetes given at versailles in sixteen sixty eight by louis the fourteenth tells us that de bord en vite sur le theatre un collation magnificite de oranges de portugal and in his own comedy la vere when harpagon apologizes to his mistress for not having prepared a collation for her his son replies j'ai pour vous mon père je ai fait au poirier ici quelques bassins de oranges de la chine de citrons du et de confitures also according to le emery trait de la seventeen o five the citron was supposed to give a better colour to the lips and the ladies of the court in the seventeenth century therefore portant un main de citron du quel mordant de tem et tem pour avoir le vive vimel le grand de aussi vi privi de francais tom i page two fifty one riquette with the tuft riquette a la hoop is perhaps the least known of the eight contes de la mer le oeil but although it has not the attractive qualities which have occasioned the popularity of the others it is an excellent story with a valuable morale though strangely enough the morality with which it concludes takes no notice of it the object of the story is evidently to show the superiority of mental to personal qualifications and the power of the former not only to compensate for ugliness and deformity but even to make one forget them the concluding verses however point only to the fact that love can embellish its object and turn even defects into beauties passing over the more important one of the cause of the love itself some writers have fancied the hero of this story to have been a person of distinction at the court of louis the fourteenth forgetting that like the rest of the collection it is a histoire de terme passé but as monsieur de plancy remarks on voy souvent de allusions au ne y en a point and as in the case of le chat bot the application may have been made to the man from the story the reader has been referred to this appendix by a marginal note at page thirty two respecting the quelle de renard the explanation offered by the editor of the french edition of eighteen twenty six is that le cuisineur algan se coiffant dans le négligé de travail dans la penue de quelque animal dont le laison pondre la queue and he adds on voit encore dans certaines provinces de chaussures coiffe ainsi that a huntsman should sport a fox's brush or wear a cap made of the fur of any animal is not in the least remarkable or uncommon but i do not see how it can be taken as a fact in support of the assertion that cooks did so either in the time of louis the fourteenth or at present and the editor does not give us any authority for that assertion of all animals a fox would be the last i should imagine a french cook would select to furnish him with a trophy or a sign of company and that twenty or thirty rosetiers should all have a landor a la main a la 
Q. de Renard, Sir L'Oye, appears to me, if we are to consider the author to have meant actually the tail of a fox, a very remarkable circumstance, as the use of the definitive article in both cases shows the Q. de Renard must have been as much the mark of a cook as the Landor, or larding pin. I confess I am not satisfied with this explanation, and all my researches and those kindly made for me by friends, both in Paris and London, have hitherto failed in throwing any light upon this curious passage. Q. de Renard is the name of a plant known by us as foxtail, and it is also applied to a particular family of flowers, but it is likewise the name of an implement. O till a du bisseau un chaffrains par le boat dans et se cert pour parse Besserelle. This description looks vastly like some accessory to the larding pin. The same authority has also Q de Renard et Etoupe, le Q est cet animal dans le savant de Dures pour appliquer le fille d'or d'argent. This, as we know, is not the entire brush, but a portion of the hair. In default of any positive information, I will merely make three suggestions. One, a portion of the herb foxtail, dried, which might be used as a whisk, two, a small instrument for piercing or skewering, three, a portion of the brush as used by gilders of wood or metal, and probably by the rotissiers of that day, as we find it was customary to gild the beaks and legs of the game and poultry served up at the royal banquets. Favin, amongst other writers, tells us of a grand banquet in which la quatrième service fut de asso tan grand que petit et tout le service fou doré in the form of curry there is a receipt for making viande royale royal in which the cook is told after he has dressed it in dishes palate to take a bar of gold foil and another of silver foil and lay home them on st andrew's cross wise above the potage and then take sugar plate or ginger plate or paste royale and cut horn of lozenges and plant horn in the void places between the bars and serve it forth the peacock served in his heckle, i.e. neck feathers, or in his pride, i.e. with tail displayed, etc., has always his bill gilt. Whatever, in fine, the Q de Renard may have been, I cannot doubt that worn Sir L'Oyer, it was a distinctive mark of a rotisserie of that day, as a pen behind the ear has been of a clerk in ours, and the probability is in favour of the third interpretation, as rotisseries were, as their name implies, those cooks who prepared the roasted dishes only, and in all the old accounts it is especially the roti than the doré. Riqui de la Hoop is supposed to have inspired Madame de la Villeneuve with the idea of the beauty and the beast. In my notice of that story I shall have a word to say in refutation of that supposition. Riquet with the tuft was the first of those fairy extravaganzas which the public have so kindly received during twenty years, at the Olympic, Covenant Garden, Drury Lane, the Haymarket, and Le Lyceum. It was written in conjunction with Mr. Charles Dance, and produced at the Olympic under Madame Vistris Management, December 26, 1836. Little Thumbling Le Petit Poussette 
this story under the titles of hop o my thumb little thumb and his brothers etc has been continually reprinted amongst our english nursery tales and i have already spoken of ogres and seven league boots there is little else in it that calls for observation the latter are said to have been fees i e enchanted as the key in bluebird the attempt of the parents to lose the children in the wood is an incident in madame de Olney's story of finette cintron drawn no doubt from the same source as cambry in his voyage au finisterre bears witness to la petite pouchette having been an ancient conte populaire which has for ages amused les enfants de la basse bretagne i think it is quite unnecessary for me to go into the question of this story being founded on an episode in homer's odyssey to prove that perrault was not thinking of ulysses in the cave of polyphemus or that the pebbles and bread were not suggested by the clue of adrian in grimm's kinder und hansmerchen are several stories about thumbling and i need scarcely remind the reader that england has her own renowned thomas thumb End of section 41. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 42 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Appendix The Countess de Morat by James Planchet Henriette Julie de Castelnau, daughter of Michel, second Marquis de Castelnau, governor of Brest, and granddaughter by the mother's side to the Count de Aignan, Marshal of France, was born at Brest in 1670. At the age of 16 she came to Paris in the costume worn by the peasants in Brittany, the language of which province she spoke very fluently. Her appearance in this dress caused such a sensation that the Queen desired her to wear it on her presentation at court. She married Nicholas, Count de Moret, colonel of infantry and brigadier de arms de roy descended from a family established in auvergne before thirteen hundred and that afterwards passed into dauphine being suspected by madame de maintenon of having been part author of a libel in which all the persons composing the court of louis the fourteenth in sixteen ninety four were caricatured or insulted she was banished to auc department de jure after the death of louis the fourteenth the regent duke of orleans at the request of madame de parbert recalled madame de Maret in seventeen fifteen she did not however long enjoy her return to paris as she died at her chateau bazdier in maine the following year seventeen sixteen at the early age of forty six she was the author of many works both in prose and verse but is best known by her conte de fee six of the most popular of which are here translated four of these le parfait en moi angulette jeune et belle and le palais de la vengeance were printed in seventeen sixty six and again in eighteen seventeen in the collection of fairy tales attributed to the countess de Aulnoy, of whom madame de marat was the contemporary but certainly not the rival 
her stories have more the character of romances and novels than fairy tales with a strong infusion of sentiment such as to be found in the writings of madame de segudry mademoiselle de lafayette the countess de Ocquenel, and others of that period the plots of them were most probably taken from les contes in jeans quelque rempli de la dress qu'ont inventé de la troubadours for to this she is specially invited in the verses at the end of the prose story of l'endroit princesse which is dedicated to her and attributed to parent it has been shown however that if that version of l'endroit princesse were really written by him it was not published till seventeen forty two thirty-nine years after the death of the reputed author and twenty-six after the death of the lady to whom it is dedicated perfect love le parfait amour is a story exhibiting considerable talent although deficient in those lively sallies those amusing whimsicalities and allusions to the manners and dresses of the period which give so much piquancy to the fairy tales of perrault and the more elaborate compositions of madame de Aulnoy. the interest is entirely of a serious character but the magic ring with its power over the four elements the value of which is destroyed by the too hasty wish of the lover is an ingenious and dramatic idea and the fatal lamps a true affecting situation this is the first fairy tale that gives us a picture of the gnomes and their subterraneous magnificence a superstition existing all over europe the trolls or underground men of the north the little people and the ground mannequins of germany and the core or corrid of brittany the wise and prudent little people who keep warm by their fine fires many a fathom down within the inmost rocks pure native gold and the rock crystals shaped like towers clear transparent gleam with colors thousandfold through the fair palace and the little folks so happy and so gay amuse themselves sometimes with singing and accordingly we find them singing the charms of irolite and entertaining the lovers with une musique forte harmonieuse mais un peu barbare Angulette. Angulette is a story of the same character as Le Parfait Amour. The interest is wholly serious, and the termination tragical, reminding one, by the transformation of the victims into trees, of the catastrophe of the Yellow Dwarf, of Madame de Aulnoy. The inconsistency of Atmir is very naturally drawn and there is considerable merit in the general conduct of the story young and handsome jeune et belle might almost be placed amongst the pastoral romances of de urfi and george de montmeyer it is full of watu like tableaux many of them suggested probably to the writer as to the painter of the fete champette so much in vogue during the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries as the court of versailles the sudden and unexpected introduction of zephyr at the very close of the story as the du et machina is quite in accordance with the taste of the period though much out of place in a fairy tale it is not however for me to find fault with it as it afforded me a hint for a character which enabled mr robson to display the versatility of his genius in the last of that long series of extravaganzas i have already alluded to in the collection above mentioned this tale was substituted for madame d'aulnoy's serpentine vert the 
denouncement of which is also produced by the congruous introduction of mythological personages the palace of vengeance le palais de vengeance was printed in the collection as madame de Aulnoy's under the title of the palace of revenge it is principally remarkable for its satirical conclusion a very original one for a fairy tale as the lovers are married and do not live happily ever afterwards the prince of leaves le prince de la file is to my best of knowledge presented for the first time in an english garb it is more of a fairy tale than the four preceding it and appears to me to have been suggested to madame de murat by her residence at auc which indeed is most likely to have been written the natural history of the turquoise has been newly popularized by the publications of chardin and other oriental travellers and more particularly by that of a book by bothius de boot le parfait joliet lyons sixteen forty four the turquoise de la ville roche that madame de Marat speaks of is a stone found near nishapur and karasan in persia the true oriental turquoise whilst those called de la nouvelle roche are not stones but petrified bones and are found in europe particularly in france at auc the very place to which madame de Marat was exiled and near sinmour in the department de jure and in the nivermain according to the account of remur in the memoir de l'academie seventeen fifteen turquoises were formerly very highly prized and all kinds of virtues and properties attributed to them the greater part of which are fabulous although detailed gravely by de boot who was physician to rodolph the second emperor of germany the jewellers even in his day took great pains to distinguish between those that retained their colour and those that turned green a fine unchanging turquoise the size of a filbert sold in that day for two hundred thalers and upwards the turquoise possesses such attractions says de boot that men do not think their hands are well adorned nor their magnificence sufficiently displayed if they are not decked with some of their finest the name is supposed to have been derived from turkey the country from which they were probably first imported but others deduce it from turchino a name given by italians to a particular blue even at this day the discoloration or loss of a turquoise is considered a prognostication of evil the fortunate punishment le herez pin is also i believe new to the english reader it is an exceedingly graceful story and denouncement is novel as well as ingenious the little animal in which the unfortunate nami is transformed is not specified by the author but from an allusion to its manière de marche i suppose it to be a crayfish a favourite with the writers of fairy tales end of section forty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section number forty three of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Appendix Mademoiselle de la Force by James Planchet charlotte rose de la force was the daughter of francois de camont marquis de castle morin and granddaughter of jacques de camont 
Duke de la Force, whose escape from the massacre of Saint whose escape from the massacre of Saint Bartholomew is celebrated in the Honraid of Voltaire, and whose afterwards greatly signalized himself by his exploits during the reign of Henry the Fourth and Louis the Eighth. She was born in the castle at Castelnove, near Bass in Guinea, about 1650, and died in Paris in 1724. Her mother, Marguerite de Vicoff, was Dame de Castelnove and daughter of the Baron de Castelnau. Mademoiselle de la Force would therefore appear to be maternally connected with Madame de Marat she is said to have been married in sixteen eighty seven to charles de brion but that the marriage was declared null and void ten days afterwards she was the author of several memoirs and romances and of an epistle in verse to madame de maintenon but is best known by her fairy tales Conte de Conte, though only one of them has to my knowledge appeared previously in english that one is fairer than a fairy plus belle que fille was published with the usual abridgments and alterations about twenty years ago in a collection of nursery tales the story bears a strong resemblance to the gracieuse and penchant of the countess de Aulnoy and although the plot is rendered more intricate by the addition of another pair of lovers it does not gain an interest as much as it loses in coherence and simplicity the fair author has however appended a note to her story called le enchanteur which forbids us to suppose that she was indebted to any previous writer for the plot of her story she says this story La Enchanteur is taken from an ancient romance, Asian Livre Gothic, named Percival, several things being omitted which were not in accordance with our modern tastes, and several others added. Some names are changed. It is the only story that is not entirely the composition of the author. All the others are purely of her invention. After this positive declaration, which we have no right to question, why should we refuse to give credit to the Countess de Aulnoy for the possession of equal powers of imagination? I am by no means impugning the originality of Plus Belle de Fille in pointing out that the notion of the fair of time seems to have been suggested by an old fairy legend of Normandy. Near the village of Puy, half a league to the northeast of Dieppe, there is a high plateau, surrounded on all sides by high entrenchments, except that over the sea where the cliffs render it inaccessible, it is named La Cité de Lime, or Le Camp de César, or simply Le Catel, or Castel. Tradition tells that the fees used to hold a fair there at which all sorts of magic articles from their secret stores were offered for sale and the most courteous entreaties and blandishments were employed to induce those who frequented it to become purchasers but the moment any one did so and stretched forth his hand to take the article he had selected the perfidious fees seized him and hurled him down the cliffs I cannot say that Mademoiselle de la Force had made the most of this tradition, supposing her to have been acquainted with it. Her allusion to the in entertainments at Marley, to which alone she says this fair was to be compared, has reference, I think, to a fancy fair, as we should call it, in which the stalls were attended, as in our days, by the principal personages of the court. I feel satisfied that I have somewhere seen an account of that entertainment, but unfortunately have no note which would enable me to turn to the authority. The Good Woman La Bonne Femme is far superior to Plus Belle que Fille. It is 
indeed worthy of Madame de Aulnay, and I cannot account for it never having previously met with a translator. It will be recognized by playgoers as the foundation of my fairy extravaganza, The Good Woman in the Wood, in which form the dramatic incidents of this charming story were first introduced to a London public, as we are bound, after the author's declaration, to consider it an original story we need not trouble ourselves to hunt after its source. The other original fairy tales, Personette, Tourbillon, Vert et Bleu, Le Pays de Delixies, and Le Poisson d'Armoire, bear no comparison to the two I have selected. End of section 43. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 44 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Appendix Madame de Villeneuve by James Planchet. Gabrielle Susan Barbeau, daughter of a gentleman of Rochelle, and widow of Monsieur de Gallant, Seigneur de Villeneuve, Lieutenant Colonel of Infantry, died at Paris in the house of Sir Brion, the tragic writer, December twenty ninth, seventeen fifty five. Such is the sum of the information afforded us by editors and biographers concerning the author of one of the most popular fairy tales ever written, The Beauty and the Beast. La Belle et la Bête Thousands of English readers have no doubt been all their lives under the impression that they knew nearly by heart the story of Beauty and the Beast, and though few, alas, may have taken the trouble to inquire who was the author of it, those who have imagined themselves indebted for it to Madame the Prince de Beaumont. Nay, there are many, no doubt, in France, who are under the same belief, for La Belle et la Bête par Madame le Prince de Beaumont is without a word of explanation at this moment circulating as a portion of the French railway library, and was published, with various other stories, in a small edition of Comte de Fille, only last year, under her name, by a bookseller on the Quai de Augustine, Paris. It is only those who have read the original story by Madame de Villeneuve, either in the Comte Marin or in the Cabinet de Fille, who will not be surprised to find that Madame Beaumont has merely the merit of having cut this admirable work down to the smallest comprehensible dimensions, and made a pretty little nursery tale of one of the most ingeniously constructed stories in the whole catalogue of fairy chronicles. The story of the beast is but alluded to in few words, and that of the real parents of beauty altogether is admitted. It is no answer to say that the version by Madame Beaumont is an agreeable story, that the moral is preserved, and that there are portions of the original tale which required alteration or omission. In justice to Madame Villeneuve, it ought never to be printed without the acknowledgment that it is simply an abridgment of her composition, adjusted to the use of juvenile readers by Madame Beaumont. I have omitted a dozen lines and softened one objectionable expression, but, with the exception of this very slight and indispensable alteration, Madame de Villeneuve's story is now placed before the English public in its entirety. It was published in 1740, and Mr. Dunlop remarks, it surpasses all that has been produced by the lively and fertile imaginations of France or Arabia but in his notice of the tales of Perrault, 
he says that it is an expansion of and adoption from Riquet de la Hoop. I think this is one of those hasty conclusions of which we are all occasionally guilty. I cannot, for my part, see any resemblance between the two stories. In Riquet, an ugly and deformed prince wins the hand of a lovely princess, the usual triumph of mind over matter. But in Beauty and the Beast, the suitor is not merely a repulsive man, but a monster of the most horrible and tremendous description, and who is specially prohibited from availing himself of those mental powers which might in the slightest degree affect the judgment of a lady. Pity and gratitude are the motives which influence beauty to sacrifice her own happiness to ensure that of the beast. In the other case, admiration of the talent of Riquet renders the princess gradually blind to the defects of his person. Le Mouton of Madame de Aulnoy offers indefinitely more points of resemblance. The transformation of the king into a ram by a jealous and vindictive fairy, and the permission given to him by Mervelouse to visit her family on her solemnly promising to return by a stated period, are features too obvious to be overlooked. The despair of the ram in consequence of her not fulfilling her promise on the last occasion is also like that of the monster, but Madame de Villeneuve has avoided the tragic catastrophe, and notwithstanding the similarity I have pointed out, Beauty and the Beast, taken as a whole, deserves all the praise that those who are best acquainted with it have unanimously accorded to it. It is a curious circumstance that the Gata Centralonia of Basil and the German version of Cinderella both commence with the departure of the father on a jury, and the requests of his daughters correspondingly exactly in their general character with those in Beauty and the Beast, while we find nothing in the sort of Perrault's Cendrillion. I infer from this that the Italian and German writers have mixed two old stories together, and that Madame de Villeneuve is founded on one of them. End of section 44. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 45 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Appendix The Count de Calais by James Plache. Anne Claude de Toubière de Grimaud de Pastille de Levy, Comte de Calais, was born in Paris in 1692 and died the 3rd of September, 1765. He entered the French army early and distinguished himself in Catalonia and at the siege of Freiburg. After the Peace of Rassault, he visited Italy and in 1717 went to the Levant in the suite of the ambassador of France to the sublime port. During this journey he undertook an adventure which proves his courage as well as his love of art. On arriving at Smyrna, he was anxious to profit by the necessary delay of a few days to visit the ruins of Ephesus, which are about twelve hours' journey from that place. The neighborhood was at that time infested by a band of brigands, the chief of which was the notorious and terrible Caracayoi. The roads were exceedingly unsafe for travelers, but the Count de Calais was not to be daunted. He provided himself with a dress made simply of sailcloth, and carrying nothing about him that could tempt the most petty thief, he sought out two of the band of Caracayoi, and bargained with them for a safe conduct from Smyrna to Ephesus, and back again, 
the money to be paid only on his return. It being their interest to take care of him, he found them the most faithful guides in the world. Karakayoi, on learning the object of his journey, politely offered to assist his researches. He informed the Count that in the neighborhood of his retreat there were some ruins well worthy his inspection, and to expedite his visit to them he mounted him and one of his guides on two fine Arabian horses. The ruins proved to be those of Colophon. The Count returned to the retreat of Caracalloy and passed the night there and the next morning proceeded to the site of the ancient city of Ephesus, from whence he was safely conducted back to Smyrna by the brigands, each party well satisfied with their bargain. After his return to France in 1717, he made several other journeys abroad, and paid two visits to London. At Paris he occupied himself with drawing, music, painting, writing, and sculpture. He wrote the lives of mo the most celebrated painters and sculptors of the Royal Academy, and founded in that academy an annual prize for the students who were the most successful in expressing the passions. In 1742 he was elected an honorary member of l'Académie de Inscriptions, in which he founded another prize of 500 livres for the best essays on the manners and customs of the ancients. He formed a splendid collection of Etruscan, Greek, Roman, and Gaulish antiquities, and an account of which was published seven volumes, four chapters, the last in 1767, by Monsieur Le Beau. He discovered the ancient art of encaustic painting, and of tingling marble from hints in the works of the elder Pliny. But all this occupation and study did not prevent this eminent scholar and antiquary from indulging in the lighter pursuits of literature. He did not disdain to acknowledge the fascination of a fairy tale, or to contribute to the number of them. I have selected three from his Fieri's novelle, which are in my judgment the best and display the greatest variety of style and power of imagination. The first, Princess Minute and King Floridor. La Princess Minute and the Roy Floridor is written in a spirit of playful satire, which reminds one of those sprightly characters of fairy tales which flowed so pleasantly from the pen of Count Hamilton. But unlike Le Bellier and Le Fleur de Epine of that accomplished satirist, Princess Minute and King Floridor presents us with a sound and serious morale, which at this moment, when the sacrifice of important interests to routine and etiquette has caused so much amiadversion, is singularly apropos. It also reads a pleasant lesson to those who neglect or misuse the great means and opportunities which it has pleased Providence to, to bestow upon them, and amidst all its whimsical extravagances never ceases to whisper in the words of Solomon, Go to the ant, though sluggard, consider her ways to be wise. Floridor was the name of a celebrated French actor of the 17th century. In Le Temple du Destin, written by Le Sage, and acted at the fair of St. Laurent in 1715, the high priest of destiny observes upon the vanity of an actor, tout ce qui relute ne pas, or il au tout ce génie, chasson ce quoi, un floridor la plaisant mani the impossible enchantment le enchantment impossible is an amusing story with one blemish which i have ventured to correct by the omission of half a dozen lines and the suppression of an unnecessary indelicacy unlike the last this is a mere work of fancy without any particular object 
a sort of illustration of the old song and saying love will find out the way the mareman and his sister would seem to point out a breton origin for this story as the belief in these marine marvels is strong upon the coast of brittany where the females are called morgan sea women or morvdi sea daughters and are supposed to draw down to their places of gold and crystal at the bottom of the ocean those who venture imprudently too near the edge of the water but the count de Calus was too well acquainted with the classical tritons and sirens to render it necessary for him to draw upon the legends of amorica for such materials and it is probable the story is entirely of his own invention the absurd fashions in hairdressing glanced at in this story by the introduction of a fairy with her hairdress en chifu are commented upon in a little volume called histoire de la mode francais amsterdam and paris seventeen seventy three the number of these frissures says the writer is almost infinite every year every month produces new ones we have seen in succession hair dressed en bequil crutch fashion un grain de epards spinach fashion and baton repos broken stick yesterday it was un ale de pigeon today it is un debacle bluet and coquelicot bluet and coquelicot is a charming fairy tale of the pastoral order unexceptionable in its style and salutary in its instruction i have only to add in further illustration of the headdress of arganto page three sixty that the foreign marshal powder was advertised in seventeen eighty one at sixteen shillings per pound by r languine at the sign of the rose opposite new round court strand and that receipts for making it occur as late as in gray's supplement to the pharmacopoeia in eighteen thirty six the author of le histoire de mode francais quoted above says he does not despair of one day seeing rose-colored hair powder blue heads etc and in plocanimos seventeen eighty one we actually find receipts for making yellow rose pink and black hair powder while goldsmith in his citizen of the world letter three mentions both black and blue end of section forty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 46 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Appendix Mademoiselle du Libert by Author James Planchet. Of this lady we have but very meagre information. She was born about the year 1710, and is said by some writers to have been the daughter of a president, and by others of a treasurer de marine. She appears to have led a studious and retired life, her love of literature indisposing her to marriage. Her contes de fille were commenced about seventeen forty and several have been attributed to her pen which she disavowed those she acknowledged were to Sirion, la princesse leonette et le prince coquiro le prince glass et la princesse in calente la princesse couleur de rose et le prince celadron la princesse camillon and la nouvelle lionel 
she was also the author of a translation of amadis de gaul les hautes fêtes de Esplandian, and anecdotes africans published in seventeen fifty two voltaire and fontel called her muse and grace she was living in seventeen seventy two and died before seventeen seventy nine she had disappeared from society for some time previously and was presumed to be still living at that date but a letter written by some one who knew of her decease inserted in the journal de paris in of that year number sixty nine addressed to the author of le almarque de dames illustre by la ombre de la mademoiselle de lubert and dated from the mill en une bossette de champ elysee seems to have been considered sufficient authority though as no precise time or place is mentioned the letter might have been written by the lady herself had she wished to deceive the public she had however reached a very respectable age and it is probable that she was dead at that period her comte de Fli remarks one of her critics we are not nearly equal to those of mademoiselle de marat and other ladies who have written in that style they have less of moral purpose and allegorical allusion this is quite true and my object in publishing the two i have selected is to illustrate as i have mentioned in my preface the decline of the fairy tale mademoiselle de lubert is one of the latest of her class her stories are only designed to amuse the publication of the thousand and one nights by galland and the immense popularity that work immediately obtained evidently affected the composition of fairy tales wild extravagant adventures unconnected incidents transformations without point or object a straining after merely marvellous and a total abandonment of the laughing philosophy and the unaffected morality which distinguish and immortalize the stories of perrault and de aulnoy were the first effects of the circulation of the arabian nights entertainments the next was the orientalizing of every tale of enchantment dull caliphs and sultans disposed the merry old kings who once upon a time ruled in fairyland the amours of the seraglio and the harem were substituted for the innocent courtships of princes or shepherds the manners and dresses of the time those delicious anachronism which imparts so much pleasantry a and instruction to the fairy tale were carefully avoided and the characters arrayed in what the writers flattered themselves were eastern costumes were seriously placed in situations compared to which that of molaire's monsieur jourdain at mamamochi was a nearer approach to reality even those that had some claim to oriental origin were so altered and manufactured for the european market that they were said to appear en sortant de chasse barbine plus arabe qu'en arabie le mercure galant was flooded with these productions alamanzor as zerha conte arabe alarmine de zalima conte oriental balki conte oriental zaman histor oriental etc then we have conte mongol conte turks conte chinois conte tartars conte parzin etc but we are forgetting mademoiselle de lubart and her princess chameleon a translation of la princess chameleon much abridged and altered was published in the child's fairy library some twenty years ago under the title of princess minikin the plot of this story is intricate without being ingenious the persecution of camion by mar 
mot is purely capricious and her contrivances are of the clumsiest description in the original zerfil is commanded to take off one by one the scales of the whale but a whale has no scales that it could feel the deprivation of it is skinning the fish alive that would be a cruel operation and i have therefore rendered ecorcier in that sense and not to scale as it had been previously translated in accordance with the specific direction quoted above the transformation of the unfortunate princess into a crayfish and her being shelled instead of pounded as marmont had decreed is all of the same character the long story told by her in that state to the other crayfish in the plantation is a lame way of enlightening either zerfil or the reader and has to be continued in as lame a manner by citronette the pounding the crayfish for the king's soup and the disappearance of them in flames when they are put into the mortar seems to point to an eastern origin the latter portion reminds us of the black man flinging the fish into the fire in the story of the fisherman and the genius in the arabian nights where there is also a city changed into a lake and all its inhabitants into fishes and re-transformed in the end and restored to the rightful monarch the young king of the black island the crayfish broth may be an allusion to the well-known bisque et crevice but it is also an oriental dish for while this book was passing through the press a morning journal announced that the eldest royal son of his majesty the first king of siam on his arrival at claridge's hotel after satisfying himself that due provision had been made for the comfort of his staff retired to rest having first partaken of a frugal repast prepared by his own chef de cuisine consisting of crabfish pounded with various eastern condiments morning post october thirty first eighteen fifty seven the eagerness with which the nobles of the court sought for the servile office of filling the king of the whitney's bowl with sea-water is the only stroke of satire in the story and evidently leveled at the candle holding and similar ceremonies of le grand et le petit coucher to stand and hold a bougie allume while louis the fourteenth undressed himself was says saint simon une distinction et une favor qui le sont complet tant le roi avait la art de donner le acte le de la reine in a note to the expression shrieks like melusins page three hundred and ninety eight i have suggested that some portion of princess camion might have been founded on the romance of melusine this romance was composed towards the end of the fourteenth century by jean de Ars, at the desire of the duke de berry son of john king of france and was founded on an incident recorded in the archives of the family of louis Gan, which were in possession of the duke it is briefly as follows the legend of Malusine. a king of albania named alanius had married the beautiful fay presine by whom he had three daughters at birth Malusine, melor and palatine Frey had stipulated that he should never enter her chamber during the period of her confinement but the king having broken his promise in his anxiety to embrace his newly born children the queen cried out that she was compelled to leave him and immediately disappeared with her three daughters she retired to the court of her sister the queen of the isle perdue and as her children grew up instructed them in the art of sorcery melusine having 
learned from her mother the conduct of her father determined to be revenged on him and proceeding to albania by means of her newly acquired art carried off the king and shut him up in a mountain called brandaloy the queen who still retained some affection for her husband on becoming acquainted with this unnatural act punished melusine by sentencing her to become every saturday a serpent from the waist downwards till she should meet with a lover who would marry her on condition of never intruding on her during the time of her transformation when she was ordered to bathe with a promise that if she strictly attended to this injunction she might eventually be relieved from her weekly disgrace and punishment melusine was excessively beautiful and raymondin son of the count de forez having met with her in the forest of clombier fell in love with her so deeply that he married her without hesitation on the prescribed conditions she built for him near the spot where they had met the castle of Luisigan, and bore him several children but her husband's jealousy being excited by a cousin who suggested to him that melusine had a criminal object in secreting herself on a saturday he made a hole with his sword in the door of the chamber to which she was wont to retire and perceived her in her state of transformation the various versions of this legend differ in the details of the consequences but all agree in stating that melusine reproaching him with the breach of his word disappeared and left him to his, end his days as a hermit on montserrat the popular belief was that she appeared on what was called the tower of melusine when any of the lords of Lusigan were about to die, and Mesere assures us, on the faith of peoples who were not by any means credulous, that previous to the death of Lusigan, or a, of a king of France, she was seen on this tower in the morning dress, and uttered for a long time the most heart-piercing lamentations. The Duke de Montpensier destroyed the castle in fifteen seventy four on account of the resistance made to his arms in it by the huguenots but the family of louise gan till it merged in that of montmarcy luxembourg continued to bear for its crest a woman bathing in allusion to the story of melusine ang pour la figure et serpent pour la rest Delzal, Princess Lionette and Prince Coquerico. La Princess Lionette et le Prince Coquerico is an infinitely better story than La Princess Camion, but like that, its aim is no higher than to excite the interest and awaken the wonder of its readers. As a work of fancy, however, it is one of the best of its class and I believe it is now for the first time translated into English. I do not recollect any story on which it could be said to be founded, but at the end of Le Tyrannine de la Fille de Truet by the Countess de Anil is a story entitled La Princesse Lyon, in which a princess is changed into a lioness, and persecuted by a fairy called la Ransoon, but there is the similarity ends mademoiselle de lubert edited the edition of the nouvelle Comte de la fille of the countess de anil and may have taken an idea from that particular incident the model of the globe in which prince Coquero saw and heard all that passed in the universe and witnessed the opera, the play, and the orations at the Académie Française, reminds one of the room in the Palace of the Beast, the various windows of which afforded beauty similar entertainment. The fairy T 
tiger lines employments of spinning and threading pearls is in strict accordance with the manners of the sixteenth century passions avec les dames said rabelais nostra vie et la nostra temp a infilie le père o la filie comme sardine pas livre e chapter thirty three i have mentioned page four hundred thirty eight that the opera of armide was considered the chef oeuvre of quinault the music was composed by lou lilly and it is reported that he made quinault write the last act over again five times which so disgusted the poet that he ceased to write for the stage from that period the incident of the shield is that in which Obdaldo holds before Rinaldo his adamant or diamond shield, in which the latter sees himself reflected in his infeminate attire, is awakened to sense of his degraded situation, and abandons the enchanted gardens of Armida. Book sixteen. End of section forty six. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen. Vancouver, B.C.